and welcome uh, to the Zero M talk. So, um, my name is Muharrem Hanyadovic. I worked for Monetas. Um, just in case you never heard about Monetas, uh, this is no small wonder because Monetas uh, is not related to cloud computing whatsoever. Uh, it's a company in crypto finance. And um, when I s submitted this talk, I, I was with Rackspace and I switched industries in April this year. I didn't want to, to cancel the talk and drop out. That's sort of boring. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, this is the summary of my talk. In case your wife calls you on a mobile phone, you need to run out. You know, these are the two main points to take away from this talk. So, Zero VM uh, creates a secure and isol isolated execution environment that allows users to run a single application or program. So we're talking, we're talking about virtualization, but not virtualization of entire machines. We're talking ab about an execution environment for single programs, for single processes. And the second uh, point is that Zero v VM lends itself very well to being embedded into storage systems. A couple of technical details. Um, so Zero VM, the Zero VM project was started by a, by a startup uh, that was acquired by Rackspace um, maybe, uh, maybe like nine months ago. And um, that startup uh, was looking around for technology. They didn't want to write uh, a virtualization platform from scratch. That just makes no sense for a startup. So they said, okay, what could we base our virtualization platform on? Is there anything that we could utilize, that we could, that we could leverage? And um, they looked at Chromium. So Google has this uh, Chrome and Chromium uh, family, family of browsers, and they also have the Chrome OS uh, project, which allows you to like, operate uh, a laptop using a browser. Okay. And what Google needed at the time was the capability to write extensions uh, to these browsers uh, and these, ex ex these extensions needed to be written in C or C++ or Go these days and have near native performance, but nevertheless still be safe to run inside the browser. Okay. And so the engineers who were looking around said, okay, well, this is great. This is just what we need. Uh, we, we'll take this uh, native client uh, code and we will uh, extricate it from Chromium. So basically cut it out there. And this is what we will, this is what we will base our uh, zero VM uh, virtualization platform on. So, the ob obvious the obvious advantages are, uh, you know, Google is pretty well known for doing good engineering, and uh, what you also get this way are all the security promises or premises of the native client. So, how does this work? Um, basically, what you need to do is. Uh, if you want to run any kind of code I inside native client, you need to, to cross-compile. You need to take the code and cross-compile it. Okay. And what, what, this, what the cross-compilation process will do is <coughs> it, it will uh, make sure that, that anything that's sort of risky or dangerous in terms of uh, instructions is, uh, is either being disabled or it uses or, the, or the, the certain instructions are redefined so that the code you're running can't break out of the, uh, of the sandbox. Okay, so in terms of programming, if you want to like prepare an application that runs inside native client, uh, you need to program either in C, but um, we also ported the Python uh, interpreter. So at this point, you can just run normal Python code inside, uh, uh, inside the zero VM uh, virtual machine. Some key properties. Uh, so what differentiates zero VM is that it's really very small. I believe uh, the code is only like uh, 75 kilobytes. Does, does anybody still even know what kilobytes are? We're putting all <laughs> gigabytes these days, okay. petabytes, okay. And it's a, it's a very lightweight platform. Um, uh, fast, like typically it takes like uh, five milliseconds for a zero VM uh, virtual machine to start. So we're not talking like minutes, we're talking like five milliseconds. Uh, it basically comes with the security promises of the native client. And so Google is holding like a yearly event, uh, like a, a hacking event, uh, and sponsored uh, to the tune of a couple of million of dollars, where like people who find uh, 
security vulnerabilities in the Chromium and native client platform can come and present these. And this, uh, like they're basically, you know, they're, they're being given bounties of $50,000 to $100,000 a piece. So Google is really very, very like, uh, you know, um, interested in making this a very secure platform. And we just ride on top of that. So whatever Google does on the native client side, we basically benefit from that. Hyperelastic. This sounds, this sounds a bit like a, uh, like a marketing term. But I think, it, I think in this particular case, it's justified. So hyperelastic here means, uh, you know, if you have like a virtual machine that's really fast and very lightweight, so if something starts in uh, five milliseconds and uh, requires very little resources, I mean, hyperelastic in this case means if you have like 100,000 uh, requests or hits, okay, you can afford to start 100,000 of these virtual machines and handle, handle each request in its own virtual machine. Okay. So now if you're some kind of attacker or cracker and you crack a virtual machine, well, you know, fine, congratulations. As soon as your request is, has been dealt with, this virtual machine is just thrown away. So hyperelastic meaning, uh, you know, given, the, given how lightweight the platform is and given how fast it comes up, we can afford you know, to, to, to start up you know, hundreds of thousands of these. And we can react to load uh, increases, basically, you know, b without having to do like any clunky um, auto scaling uh, group groups or whatever. You know, we see requests coming in, just with, and we just spawn zero VMs. That's it. I already mentioned that it's it's embeddable. Um, f functional or deterministic uh, comes from functional programming, and so the idea is if you if you give a function the same parameters, it will always compute the same result. So same thing for these uh, applications that you can run inside the zero VM. Basically, if you run a zero VM application and give it the same data, it will, always produce, it will always produce the same outcomes. So it is deterministic in that respect. And this can be handy because uh, you, you can reproduce the same set of results. Or you can run the same workload three times and uh, you know, do, do some kind of quorum on it. Uh, you can also interrupt uh, a virtual machine uh, and then move it to somewhere else. And it's open source. So Rackspace um, has been a big push into the open source and you know, uh, uh, there's you know, a, a, good, a, good, uh, a good community already um, being created around uh, zero VM. So you, you, can look at this, you, can, you can look at the source code and uh, you know, play with it. It's all very accessible. Uh, but let me give you a bit, let, let me try and sort of categorize a zero VM a little bit. You know, where does it fit in? Most people say, hey, uh, you know, there's this Docker thing, you know, is it, is it like Docker? Is it not like Docker? Mm -hmm. Is it a machine? It's not a machine. So, and typically, uh, you know, all, all of these virtualization solutions, you know, <coughs> break down along these lines. So we have like traditional virtual machines, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh, something like uh, VMware or whatever. And uh, it's really like uh, a full machine. So when you bring up a, like a VM instance, uh, it basically the abstraction you get is, is, a, is a full, fully fledged machine. Okay. So, and these VMs can share the hardware, uh, but inside the machine you, you have your own uh, operating system and kernel. Okay. And uh, you know, there's quite a, bit of, quite a bit of overhead of uh, running these and they're slow to come up. But you know it's very secure. It's your own machine. You know whatever you do inside, it's your own. Then we have we have containers uh, like I believe Docker being the most prominent uh, uh, solution in this space. So again, uh, uh, you know allows us to share hardware. But in this case, uh, all the containers share the kernel and the operating system, which uh, makes for low low overhead and fast startup. And you know depending on where you stand, you know it is somewhat secure. Uh, you know, the, the ways to, to, to make it as secure, you know, reasonably secure. But if you have any, I believe at this point we have like a three million lines of code in the Linux kernel. Okay, basically, you know, there's still the possibility that that somebody can 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 uh, do exploits that way. Okay, in zero VM, same thing, share shared hardware. Okay, but it doesn't even have a kernel OS. Okay, because remember, uh, the only thing you can run inside zero VM is a single process, a single application. And uh, as I said, it, it's, uh, it has a very low, low overhead and it starts up very, uh, in a very short time. And it's you know, as secure as the na native client, as secure as whatever uh, Google 
it provides. So how is this useful? I mean, how is this useful to basically um, run a virtual machine with a single program? So one thing you can do, you can use it for is, is to break down this dichotomy between compute and data. I mean, think about any kind of computation that um, operates on, on a high volume of data. You know, you know, how does it work today? So let's say you, know, you go into a direct space cloud or the Amazon cloud. So what you do, the first thing you do is you bring up a, a, an instance. <coughs> the next thing you do is, well, that instance needs to suck in all the data. It's supposed to process, okay? So you know. then the data is processed. And uh, finally, you need to, the, the result of the processing needs to be persisted again. So now you're not sucking in data, you're, you're pumping beta, data back into cloud storage. Okay. Is that the best we can do? Probably not. Okay. So what Zero VM allows you to do is uh, it can be embedded into cloud storage itself. Okay. So it's not like sucking data, crunch, crunch, crunch. Okay, once you have the results, pump it back. It's basically send the code to the data. Because these uh, virtual machines are so tiny, you can basically afford to say, hey, how about um, um, enabling, zero VM enabling Swift cloud storage? And so now I don't need to uh, move all this data around. I just, I just send an image, a tiny image, and say, run this image, run this uh, logic on this particular uh, partition of, of my cloud storage. Um, scale out architectures, so, the way you, ne you need to write applications inside zero VM is a bit different. And uh, there's, uh, there's also a bit of effort involved if you want to have something like a multi-stage application, something like a MapReduce application, okay? So you, you would need to write like a mapper and a reducer and then bring them both up, and glue them together, okay? But if you, if you do do this though, uh, you know, what you end up with is um, a system that lends, it, that lends itself very well to scale out uh, architectures. It's a, very, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good architecture for scaling out. Okay, so what the ZeroVim team has done so far is they have, uh, Zero Vim, they have enabled Swift, the OpenStack cloud storage, to run uh, ZeroVM applications. So you probably, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a very, very much of a simplification of, of what Swift, um, looks underneath the covers. So basically what you have is you have a bunch of proxy nodes and you have a much bigger uh, set of storage nodes. And when a request comes in to store something, it comes uh, into one of these proxy nodes. The proxy nodes will find n replica, whatever it was configured to do. Uh, typically it's three, or it, it, or it, will, it will basically find three storage nodes and then write uh, three copies of the data you want written. Okay. And so, what the ZeroVM project has done is they have they've written um, a piece of Python software that is deployed as part of, of, of Swift. Uh, in, this, in, in this case, we call it a Zwift, okay? So this, it is ZeroVM enabled. And yeah. there's also like a, a, there's a Zwift cluster uh, consisting of 65 nodes, storage nodes, operated as a beta service by Rexpress, and that cluster is called Zebra. And what has been done is, so the proxies as well as the storage nodes have been enabled to run uh, zero VM applications. And uh, what you can do here is you can say, oh, you know, I would like to run this zero, zero VM applications on all the objects in, underneath this URL. And then basically, you know, um, that application is run on all the objects. Uh, the, Z, the zero VM uh, scheduler on the proxy will say, oh, okay, that translates to, I don't know, 1,000 objects. You know, let, let me find where they live. Let me try to distribute this a little bit. So, you know, we're not running. Uh, so we, we, we do the processing um, as, uh, as, uh, as distributed as we can, et cetera, et cetera. And then once, the, once these uh, zero M applications uh, terminate, um, you know, uh, you will collate some kind of result or they, they will create new objects in the data store, whatever needs done. Okay, so basically what Zebra gives you is static storage operations, which we already have in cloud storage today, but uh, with the addition of the capability to run zero VM applications on this data now. So as we, as we have before, these slides will all be uh, uh, uploaded to a public, to a public pay, uh, place. 
So here's the link to go and uh, read up on Zebra and basically uh, get like a beta, beta program uh, access for it. So what are some use cases for Zebra or for any um, Zero Vim enabled uh, cloud storage? Well, you know, uh, a first good use case would be, uh, you know, MapReduce, okay? So if you, if you want to use some, something like Hadoop for MapReduce, uh, there's a big upfront effort uh, you, 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 uh, for uh, preparing your Hadoop cluster, okay? So you need to set it up, you need to have uh, all the data in there, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, uh, no such setup is needed. You basically already have your data in cloud storage. So the only thing you need to do, you need to do is you need to prepare your MapReduce application uh, or your MapReduce system, uh, which consists of two applications, of the mapper and the reducer. Uh, the third thing you need to prepare is just like a configuration file that specifies you know, how many nodes you want to use and uh, how, you want to, um, how, how you want the mappers to uh, pipe into the reducers. So, it's it's like an it's like an uh, you know it allows you to do like spontaneous MapReduce uh, work on your uh, cloud data. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can modify you can you can specify certain hooks. So whenever you put data into your cloud storage, you can say okay, for this particular uh, URL space, whenever I put a datum, whenever I store any kind of object, okay, I want uh, I want it to trigger a zero VM, zero VM application on that object. And what should be stored instead is not the object, but whatever the zero, but the result of the zero VM application. Okay, and you can you can do the same thing on the get. You can say you know whenever I fetch an object from this URL uh, space, uh, before it's being handed back to the actual requester, I want this particular application to run. And what should go back to the requester is not the original object, but the outcome, the result of the application. So some uh, use cases uh, are. Scaling images per request. Yeah. <coughs> so depending on your form factor, whether you're, you're browsing through a mobile device or desktop or whatever, okay, uh, basically uh, whenever you request an image from, from cloud storage, uh, uh, it can be scaled like uh, 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 underneath the wraps uh, seamlessly for you. Uh, the other application is to, you know, to watermark things. So whenever you, you store something, some kind of pre-processing of, of the data stored. Like if you're storing images, you know, you could, you could just watermark them seamlessly uh, when you store them. Another uh, class of scenarios this enables is uh, content creation at the edge. You know, think of something uh, like a content distribution network, okay. uh, which is at this point just, you know, just data. You know. And if you, if you could like zero vim enable a CDN, it would, be, it would allow you to do like uh, content creation at the edge. Last but not least, uh, there are certain like industries, like the video rendering industry, uh, who might benefit from, benefit from this. Like video rendering is a very uh, uh, like CPU intensive business, okay? And if you, uh, if, and also uh, involves uh, like storing huge volumes of data, okay? If you can store your, uh, your videos in cloud storage, and if you, if you could chunk them up, then you could basically run, run rendering using zero vim on, on all these chunks. So in summary, what zero vim gives you is uh, an enhanced object storage offering and a converged compute uh, and storage uh, data platform. Uh, last but not least here, a couple of pointers. Um, so the website, uh, with some additional materials, um, the uh, GitHub repository with a source code, and um, there are two mailing lists that you can use to engage with, with the project. Uh, one is like uh, just zero VM, uh, if you're interested in using this and playing with it, and the, the second one is zero VM devel, if you'd like to contribute to it. And for any kind of interactive discussions, there's a IRC channel on Freenode, pound zero VM. Ah. So this is the slide uh, that I usually put up instead of the question slide. <laughs> so if you're, in, if you're into GPG keys and want to sign GPG keys with me, please come to me later. But this is also the slide that the signals, you know, that uh, you can ask questions now if you like. So any questions?
Yes. <laughs> Rack space. <laughs> so anybody, anybody with, a, with a storage, I, I think the, the, the primary use case at this point is anybody who has like a, some kind of storage service benefits from using it. So, and uh, like cloud providers at this point. But again, like uh, there are like, um, there are talks with, with certain like video rendering companies to make use of this as well. Yeah. All right, so I'll be around um, you know, all day and if, you'll, if you want to talk about this or ask questions, feel free to um, come and see me later. Thank you.